Ferrari, McLaren, Alfa Romeo und Williams, das Teamchef-Karussell in der Formel 1 hat sich über den Winter ziemlich stark gedreht. Einer war davon überhaupt nicht betroffen, das ist Christian Horner von Red Bull Racing. Er sitzt als Teamchef fest im Sattel. Und wie ihr unschwer erkennen könnt, sind wir bei Red Bull Racing in Milton Keynes. Christian Horner hat uns zum Interview eingeladen und ich würde sagen, lasst uns mal reingehen und ihn ein bisschen ausquetschen. Christian, first of all, thank you for having us here with you at Red Bull in Pleasure. Milton Keynes. Um, Christian, back in September, you decided against the cooperation with Porsche. Now you're entering in a cooperation with Ford. Why is Ford the better partner for Red Bull than Porsche? Well, I think the discussions that we've had with Ford have been, um, they've been extremely productive. There's been a, a real willingness from you know, the senior management within Ford, from you know, Bill Ford himself, um, to get back involved in Formula One. I think they recognize that the Red Bull powertrains, um, you have got all the specialist uh, equipment and people. And so therefore, to uh, come into a partnership you know, with Ford, um, coming back into, in, into Formula One, an iconic brand with so much history you know, in the sport, um, with no participation in the actual business itself in terms of a shareholding, but opening up their technology to us was a, a very straightforward um, and uh, easy deal to, uh, to conclude because both parties wanted to make it happen. Okay. Another partner you had or you still have is Honda. Why didn't you go for Honda in 2026? Well, we have had such a great relationship with Honda and that will continue until the end of 2025. But Honda announcing their withdrawal from the sport um, we, we explored some options for 2026 if there was ways of, of them potentially being able to help us. Um, but I think that it would just be very, very difficult to have half the engine, say, designed in Japan and half in, in the UK would be logistically um, you know, very, very difficult to achieve. And so uh, we had some exploratory conversations, but it was clear that, unfortunately, that we wouldn't be able to... Uh, conclude something. In which ways can Ford then help Red Bull powertrains from 2026 onwards? Well, Ford is one of the biggest automotive uh, manufacturers in the world. And of course, they're investing very, very heavily in their own EV range. And um, that is at the, the, the core of their uh, expansion and development. So for us, with the, with the new regulations for 2026, with the battery paying and the hybrid paying a much bigger, bigger role, with almost 50% of the of the power coming from um, you know, electrification. That for us, of course, to be able to um, draw on the experience and knowledge and know-how of an OEM like Ford, um, we feel uh, bridges the gap between ourselves and the, the competitors that we're taking on, which of course are all subsidiaries of OEMs. Yeah, and now you have a big OEM on your side to go against the big OEMs like Mercedes, Ferrari, yes. Renault. So was that kind of necessary for you? I think strategically it was uh, important for us. And I think in Ford, I think we've got the right partner with the right attitude. And, uh, you know, we're, we're looking forward to it. So, uh, you know, uh, a Red Bull Ford, it, it could be, you know, Ford versus Ferrari all over again. Yeah. Coming to the, to the new season, um, you will celebrate your 50th birthday, I saw in on the Las Vegas yes. race weekend. It's a, good, it's a good weekend to have yes. a, a 50th. Yes. How much would you bet on Max being champion by then? Oh, no, nothing. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, look, you know, we had an amazing season in, in 2022. I mean, it's only now when you look back at what we did, 17 victories, three, uh, you know, two sprint race victories, um, constructors champion, drivers championship. It was an un unbelievable year. So. Uh, If we achieve 50% of that um, in terms of race wins and, and, and points, it may well still be enough to, to win the, the, the championship. But of course, you know, Ferrari had a very good car last year. They're going to come out fighting hard this year. Mercedes, I'm sure, will recover from uh, you know, their Anna's Horribles last year. So let's see. Let's see. I mean, the, the, um, the competitors are going to be very, very strong. Who will be the bigger threat then, Mercedes or Ferrari? I think both of them. I think we don't underestimate any of them. And, uh, you know, we've just got to focus on ourselves. And um, uh, the team have been working hard over the winter months. Um, uh, you know, an RB19, um, uh, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll draw on all the 
positives that we had in RB18. Do you see any other competitor being able to close the gap to you, to Ferrari, to Mercedes? Because last year there was kind of a 0 0.8, one, one second to Alpine. Well, you never know. I mean, Alpine made progress in the second half of the year. Aston Martin, we keep hearing big numbers um, coming out of uh, there in their expectations. So you just don't know in terms of, um, you know, what the running order will will be. But uh, yeah, McLaren maybe even, you know, get it together this year. So uh, inevitably, the grid should, with stable regulations, start to, you know, close up. Do you have kind of a handicap after the stuff with the budget cap? You, yep. you don't have uh, that much wind tunnel time as a defending champion. You have even less. How much of a handicap is that for the new season? Well, of course, it is a, a handicap, but we're pretty much 25% through that penalty now. Um, and it just forces the business to be more selective uh, in what runs we put into the wind tunnel. So... Um, Uh, you know, the team are doing a good job in managing that, but what effect it will ultimately have, we'll only see as the season unfolds. Okay. Do you consider yourself still as the favorites because you won two championships in a row now with Max? Well, I guess because of, because of what we achieved last year, we'll go into the season with that title. But for me, it means nothing. I think that, uh, you know, the favorite is whoever has the best car yeah. in Bahrain. Okay. You mentioned that you have to be quite efficient with your wind tunnel run, CFD, yep. etc. Do you need more or less the perfect season with the handicap you are having now on the development side? I think you've always got to be perfect to win in Formula One. You've got to, um, uh, you know, particularly with how competitive the sport now is. So the team did an outstanding job, you know, last year, the technical team, particularly when you consider 2021, we came so late into the 2022 regulations six months behind some of the other teams. Yeah. So I think the, the technical team, uh, you know, have done an incredible job. And I think, you know, Pierre Vacher and his technical group will um, hopefully come up with a good car in, in 2019. When did you start then now last season with the RB19? Well, it's very much an evolution because certain amounts of the regulations are the same. Obviously, the underfloor has, has changed. Those regulations have changed. And so there's a hit on the downforce um, for all of the teams. Um, so it was more evolution rather than revolution. Okay. You mentioned the changes on the floor. It's quite a, a big one, I think, with 15 yeah. millimeters rising the floor edges. Do you see any concept, for example, the Mercedes, the Ferrari one, or the Red Bull one, which is more affected by it? Again, I think we have to wait and see till uh, the first uh, snapshot will be the testing in Bahrain. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit strange because obviously there was a big push to get all of this changed. Um, and the changes came through around Spa last year. But by the end of the year, there was very little porpoising. Yeah. Um, so, it doesn't seem to be really necessary so, to. Which was my argument at the time. Is it, will it not just get sorted out? Which it did. So um, we've gone through quite a lot of expense for all the teams in a big regulation change that probably wasn't, wasn't needed. Okay. Uh, how much different will be the RB19 compared to the RB18? Will we see it? Will, can uh, we spot the differences? You'll see a family resemblance. You know, you'll see uh, um, for sure a resemblance because uh, you know, 18 was such a good car. It, uh, it makes sense to continue some of that philosophy and evolve that philosophy into the 19. Okay, so you still see a big potential within the concept you have? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the car was still quite... Yeah, the regulations are still very immature. We're one year in, so I'm sure there's going to be more and more evolution. Okay. Toto Wolff was mentioning from Mercedes, the team principal, that they might like half a second of the start of the season, but they think they have big potential in their car to, can, to be able to close the, the gap. Yeah. Will it just be a development race again this season because the regs are still, let's I, say, quite new? I think, I mean, Mercedes did a lot of development last year and you saw from where they started the year to where they finished, they're much, much more competitive. Um, and they bought a lot of new parts, you know, particularly in the second half of the year. So we expect them to be competitive to, to um, yeah, you have know, got two very strong drivers, so there's no reason to think that they won't be, be right there. Okay. There is an engine freeze in place, but there are rumors all over yes. the place that 
some engines will gain a lot of horsepower yes. because you can make changes to the reliability. Mm -hmm. Is that really the case or is this... Is well, it, I think that yes, the, the engines are homologated, so theoretically there shouldn't be big horsepower gains. And also the fuel is homologated, so any reports of new fuels um, shouldn't be, be permitted. Um, but of course some teams, you know, Ferrari had some reliability issues uh, last year, so if they've managed to address that and through that been able to turn up their power, inevitably they will see some form of progress. Now, Is it something you're afraid of? Because if they really can gain, let's say, 10, 20 horsepower... It's a lot. It's a lot. A lot. Yeah. So, you know, we have to be mindful of that. We saw them turn down the power after their failures last year, so we know they have the ability within their engine to turn it up more. Yeah. You have it as well? With the Red Bull Honda um, you know, We had some small reliability issues, but nothing to the magnitude of, of uh, Ferrari. Okay. There has been a lot of changes within the teams, different team principles, for example, at Ferrari. You are now with Red Bull since um, more than, I think now it's 18 years from the very yes. start. Um, have you ever been tempted to take another adventure, to take another team, for example, Ferrari? Uh, to be honest with you, no, because you know, I've been here since the very beginning. I feel very much um, uh, you know, responsible for the, for the team. It's a great group of people it's, uh, you know, that, that I, I work with. And I think that I've never been tempted away. I feel a, a loyalty to, uh, to Red Bull and, of course, the people here. Um, and, uh, and when you're working with such a great team, why... Would you want to be anywhere else? Okay. Yeah, because Ferrari is the mm -hmm. biggest team in Formula One and some might be tempted to, yes, and to take it, on Yes, and you know, it's hugely flattering um, to, uh, you know, to, have been, to have been asked by Ferrari. But, uh, you know, they're a great team and, and I'm sure they're going to be very, very competitive. Okay. Binotto is now on the market. Toto said there's no way that he could join Mercedes. Is it the same for Red Bull? Or? I don't see what role he would perform. I mean, obviously it was tough for him last year with Ferrari because they did make a big step forward. But, um, you know, maybe there's other opportunities for him you know, further down the grid. Yeah. Is stability the biggest asset Red Bull has? I think it's a crucial element. I mean, we have a very stability, stable workforce here and everybody knows what their job and role is and function is. And I think that... That is, for me, it's hugely important in part of what we've delivered, you know, over the over the years. And uh, when you look around, the senior positions in the team are, uh, are largely unchanged for quite a period of time. Mm. But then <coughs> there's a change in the, let's say, global activities of Red Bull with Oliver Minzlaff yep. after the death of uh, Dietrich Mateschitz. What changes with Oliver Minzlaff for the Formula One team? Are there any changes with well, him I, now? I haven't felt any change. To be honest with you, Oliver um, obviously has an awful lot of projects uh, under his responsibility. And I think uh, uh, obviously Formula One or certainly Rebel Racing is probably one of his fewer headaches. Um, so, uh, you know, he's been very supportive in, um, uh, in the dialogue that we've, uh, that we've had. And of course, we also have um, the passion of the shareholders as well who have um, in both, obviously, Mark Mateschitz and um, the Udiva family, who Formula One has always been a big part of. Um, you, you know, they've been, always been hugely supportive. Yeah. You had a very, very successful 2022 campaign, and everybody was speaking about Adrian Newey, the mastermind, because he was kind of foreseeing the, the bouncing issue yeah. everybody had. How big is he as an, as an asset for Red Bull Racing and how much involved is he still in the day-by-day -day business for the racing team? Well, Adrian, over the last few years, has stepped back from day-to-day -day responsibility in, in, in Formula One. Um, you know, he splits his time between advanced technology and Formula One, but of course, he has an encyclopedia of knowledge. And, and what we've seen during the last couple of years, which has been fantastic, is the technical team has really stepped up um, you know, under... Pierre's leadership, um, you know, with uh, Enrico Baldo and Ben Waterhouse and Craig uh, Skinner, um, I believe it's the strongest technical team we've, you know, we've had, um, and that's enabled Adrian to go off and first of all do the Valkyrie project, and now, of course, the RB17, which is a uh, a, a big project that we uh, announced 
halfway through last year. So, um, so of course, Adrian is is still uh, involved and there to be drawn on, but you, you know, not on a on a day to day basis. Okay. So, what does it mean? How many days a, a year does he work on the Formula One project, roughly? I think it's impossible to quantify probably in days, but. Um, uh, or if you could give us a percentage, a rough one, that maybe fifty percent of his time is focused on Formula One. Um, uh, you know, he's in the office probably a couple of days a week, on on average. So, you know, it's difficult. It's it's impossible to put numbers. No, you know, it's like anything when yeah. when when um, his attention is needed. Um, uh, he's there to be drawn on by, you know, by the technical group. Yeah. Coming to the drivers, Max did an extraordinary season last year. He did a good, a yes. more, very good campaign in 2021, winning two championships in a row now. Do you think he, he can still raise the bar or is it now that he's on the very top of his... I think at 25, he's still, he, he's still developing, he's still evolving. And I think, you know, 21, he was outstanding. 22, he, he managed to be even better. What he achieved in 21, and I think that's the exciting thing with Max that as he gains experience, he's just he's just become more rounded and versatile, and um, just deals with pressure incredibly well. And I think uh, what he's achieved has been phenomenal. Is Checo the perfect number two for Red Bull? I think Checo knows exactly what is expected from him, and I think being Max Verstappen's teammate is a pretty daunting prospect for any any driver. Um, but I think Checo has handled that very well and of course he was an integral part of us winning the constructors championship and finishing a very close third in the championship you know last year winning two grand prix so you know checo uh, has you know has again he's evolved since he joined the team in 21 okay so you don't see him really yeah challenging max for a, let's say a championship well, I, I think over a season you know, the form that max has been in is it, of course, he's he's the man to beat. He's the reigning world champion, and Checo has to, you know, strive for that. Otherwise, you know, why is he, why is he competing? Yeah. But I think you know the reality is that, or the probability is that Max over the season um, is likely to be the more uh, the more likely candidate for the world championship. But you know, Checo should also you know, he has the capability to to also be right there. So. Uh, and we need both drivers performing at the best of their their ability for the uh, constructors championship. Okay, do you see a? Is, do you think Red Bull has the best driver pairing, or do you see another pairing on that on the level? Uh, look, I think we've got a great driver pairing. Um, I think that if you look at Mercedes, they've got also got a very strong driver pairing. Ferrari got a strong driver pairing. So, I think the top three teams, um, you know, are well equipped. Uh, driver-wise, it's a question of working as a team, you know, collectively. Yeah, there was a lot of con controversy about the budget cap yep. uh, you missed in 2021. And are you 100 percent sure now that you you don't exceed it in 2022 well, can, because there is inflation, etc. Which is you could never be 100 percent sure, but I think that you know certainly all the aspects that that were a reason for us to be over. In, in 21, which remember it was the very first year of a set of very complicated regulations. Um, um, you know, we're confident that we should should be comfortably within the in the cap um, for 2022. Um, the amount of development we did was, and particularly crash damage that we had, was significantly less than than uh, you know our two competitors. So. Uh, yeah, obviously, until you've got the certificate, nothing is 100%. But um, I'd be I'd be very surprised if we weren't, um, you know, fully within the cap. Okay, but it was kind of a very late call, let's say, by the FIA to tell you in October that you yes. exceeded the budget cap. So was it really possible for Red Bull to to adjust what to do within well, the cap at that, at that point in time? Of you, you, you know. 80% of the season is done. So, yeah. um, uh, but there were some effects that were one-off effects regarding wow. personnel and sick pay and so on that related to the only 2021. So um, 
when you remove those and make the adjustments on the other topics that, that were raised, I think, you know, we're, we're, we're happy with where our submission, you know, will be. But as I say, until you, you receive total conformity, com, um, confirmation from the FIA, then, uh, you know, nothing is, nothing is 100%. When do you expect the confirmation this I would, year? I would hope earlier than October, but yeah. uh, <laughs> everybody, you know, June, July, I would have thought would be a realistic target. Yeah, it was a big effort, a massive effort for the for the especially the big teams, Mercedes, Ferrari, Red Bull, yeah. to come below yeah. the cap to match the cap. Um, is there still some um, refinement which has to be done by Red Bull Racing, or are you satisfied now with the structure you have within the team? With the I think, you know, of course, the budget cap is a daily challenge. Um, and now we have it in powertrains as well. But, uh, you know, we've had to move people um, from, uh, you know, high profile positions like, you know, Rocky, um, head of race engineering. You know, there's, we've had had to take the pain and we've done that restructuring of course during 21 coming into 22 and a small amount of that again in 22 so i think structurally we're now equipped to deal with the cap yeah to give our user the users a number how many employees does red bull racing the chassis side has at the moment roughly about 800 820 yeah and the powertrain red bull powertrains about three 350 360 okay and you will How many employees will you recruit for powertrains? It really depends on how much manufacturing we do, but I think you, you, you're going to be looking at 450, you know, maybe maybe 475, something like that. So uh, um, to try and optimize your size within the regulations. Of course, the, the challenge with powertrains is the diametric opposite of what we had with uh, with a chassis. So with a chassis, we had to go from a budget that was basically halved and reshape ourselves. Yeah. Uh, according to that size, with the, with the engine, we're coming with the from a budget that with an organization that from scratch. So we're shaping it around the budget cap. Yeah. What is the bigger exercise? The bigger challenge? Come up with a new team, or you bought a team and then started with Red Bull Racing, or start with a powertrains manufacturing from the scratch? I think both have their their different challenges. Of course, in an existing team. You've got the base infrastructure, but the culture obviously needed to change and mm. certain certain aspects of how the team operated and some of the talent within the team needed to change. I think with powertrains, it's a startup. It's completely new. Every piece of equipment, every tool, every person there we've brought together from you know so many different different companies and industries and instilling our culture, the Red Bull culture, into that. You know, it's a, a different challenge on its on its own. So I think they've both got their their pros and cons, um, but both equally significant. Yeah, and you had to pay a lot of money for getting the powertrains factory. I mean, the, the investment the Red Bull have made, uh, and we have to thank Dietrich Mateschitz for, for that as, you know, within his last business plan in September, committing to the, to the investment that there is, you know, within Red Bull, not just powertrains, but also Red Bull racing with wind tunnels and, and so on that are coming on site. You can see the campus that we have now um, that is very much geared to the long term of Formula One. Yeah, you mentioned the wind tunnel. You are having kind of an old wind tunnel at the yep. moment. You are going to build a new one. Is it kind of a game changer? Is it really necessary for Red Bull to I do that? I think we've toyed with the decision for many years and, and now there's a window of opportunity and the regulations had the opportunity to close windows or, or diminish the use of, of wind tunnels. Um, but they chose not to. Um, so there's a window of opportunity to invest in a new tunnel. And of course, to have that tunnel on site, on campus, uh, it feels like we've, uh, and particularly where efficiencies now really come into play under the budget cap, the wind tunnel we have, sort of a relic of the Cold War. It's expensive to run. It doesn't work on days like today when the temperature is less than five degrees. Um, so it has its limitations, whereas a state-of-the-art facility on campus within the allowance of what the budget cap has driven um, has almost dictated that we needed to make that investment to bring the wind tunnel on site. When will it be ready, the new wind tunnel roundabout? It'll be uh, fully commissioned for 2025. Okay. Sepp Vettel has a big history with Red Bull, um, yeah. winning four championships. 
Do you see him somehow ending up in Red Bull, maybe with a new challenge for him here in the management, or is it impossible? I don't. I don't think so. I don't. I can't see Seb doing a nine to five um, <laughs> job or moving to the UK. Um, and I think there's so many other things in his life that he wants to do and achieve. And uh, you know, with his with his family, he's a little bit of a free spirit, um, and he has many projects that he's hugely passionate about. And I think there's certain things in Formula One other than the driving that, that obviously he felt conflicted about. So maybe maybe to Formula One as an environmental advisor, there might be something you know, that he can take and use his passion. But I think in the day-to-day -day operation of a team, I'd be surpri very surprised if, if he were to get involved in that. Okay. Coming back to the US market, as we mentioned at the very beginning, Red Bull joining forces with Ford, but there is another US player wanting to join Formula One and Ratty with General mm -hmm. Motors, but there's yeah. a lot of resistance, it seems, within Formula One, especially from the team side. Why is that? Well, I think, look, Andretti is a great team and, and a great brand, and Mario Andretti is synonymous again with Formula One, and Cadillac again, another great OEM. And it's fantastic that there's this interest in the, in the sport, but I, I, I guess the, uh, the key issue is, um, or, as with all these things, always boils down to money. So. From, a, from our perspective, we would have absolutely no problem um, having an 11th team in, in Formula One. I think um, the key question is, though, is who is going to pay? Because if the teams are asked to pay for it, that is going to become a problem amongst the 10 teams. Yeah. I'd be amazed if um, all of the teams, and of course, there's two teams that are agreeing to it at the moment. One happens to be a partner of Andretti in in uh, IndyCar and the other is, is likely to be supplying an engine. So it's obvious why they would, would support it. But I think for the other eight, um, the question will be is, you know, if it comes out of the percentage of, of, of price fund that, um, you know, the, the 10 teams are currently dependent on. But don't um, you think a big player like Andretti with General Motors in the back will bring more to the Formula One? Then they will receive. It, it, it would have to bring an awful lot more. Um, so, and, and it's a question for Liberty. I mean, if Liberty are happy to pay for it to bring in that money, then I don't think anybody would have a problem. I think if if it didn't affect, if people's budgets weren't going to go down, and it would be more sensitive for a smaller team than a bigger team, obviously, um, then I don't think there'd be any problem with it at all. It's nothing personal against Andretti or um, Cadillac. It's yeah. just business economics. Because we ask ourselves, if not Andretti, Cadillac, who else could join Formula One as an 11th or 12th you've, team? You've, you've got some teams in Formula One that, you know, Audi, for example, they acquired Sauber because they wanted to come in. Yeah, but um, they buy an existing team. But, but they buy an existing yeah. franchise. And I think that's the model that's been created by Liberty that's driven the value into those teams and those franchises. If you dilute that, yeah, of but, course, they're going to have an issue. So if Andretti Cadillac wanted to come in there, of course, maybe teams further down the grid might have an interest in, 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 in talking with them. Yeah. But do you see the point? If not a player like them, like Andretti Cadillac with that name, General Motors, who else could then join Formula One? There's, it's, there's nobody, let's say an OEM won't do that, building up a well, team from they, scratch. They can if they take on a franchise. Yeah, but so, they won't if they take on, but they will not bring an 11th team. Let's say. Well, unless there's a new Concord agreement coming up in 2026, it would seem the juncture to deal with it rather than prior to that. You know, there's a commitment between now and the end of uh, 2025. So if the 2026 says there's two new teams, so long as fiscally it doesn't harm the existing teams, I can't see anybody being against it. But of course, it's like, if somebody were to ask you, there's some, a couple more writers that are going to come in. They're really talented and they're great names and so on. Um, but you're going to have to take a 20% pay cut to pay for them. Would you be happy with that? No, I wouldn't. But that's what I said. I think they... So that's the fundamental problem yeah. of who pays. Yeah, but that's what I said. I think well, most of the people think they can bring more than they really... Take well, the, I, I think the other thing is logistically, operationally, how does it work? Mm. So, um, you know, I'd love to see the Andretti brand in Formula One. Uh, you know, arguably it brings more than some of the existing franchises. Um, but 
you, you know, it, it, the fundamental question comes back to, um, you know, are the teams funding it? Is Formula One funding it? Because the one thing, the one that isn't, is the FIA because they will only get more entry fees and, and you had to pay quite fees, a high, high it, amount this year, etc. Et so um, I, I think it's a bigger discussion that needs to be held collectively between the the stakeholders. Yeah. Very last question: Which Grand Prix you're most looking for for the 2023 season? For the 2023 season, I, I think there's so much expectation around Vegas. I hit a milestone in my own life uh, <laughs> in Vegas, um, and so I'm fascinated by that race. I think it's going to be a, uh, I think it's going to be an incredible event. I've never seen demand, interest, and, and excitement about a Grand Prix like there is in in Las Vegas. All right, thank you very much, Christian, for taking time. Thank you. Red Bull and Ford spannen sich also zusammen und kooperieren. Ab 2026, wenn in der Formel 1 ein neues Motorenreglement greift. Und wie ich finde, hat Christian Horner uns nicht nur schöne Einblicke zu dieser neuen Beziehung gegeben, sondern auch eben auf die kommende Formel 1 Saison mit uns vorausgeblickt. Wenn euch das Video gefallen hat, das Interview mit Christian Horner, dann lasst uns doch ein Like da. Aktiviert die Glocke, damit ihr zukünftige Videos von uns nicht verpasst. Und natürlich würden wir uns über jedes Abo von euch freuen.